The world record has just gone by, but he doesn't care. He, oh, my God, he hasn't. It hasn't. It's won. It's, oh, I'll have to work it out. It's about 11, that 11 hundredths of a second. He's got the world record again. Incredible. What a way to win a gold medal. Setting them, you know, beating your own world record. You can't go better than that. Two world records and a gold medal from two performances today. Mark Cobra. Okay, I'm Matthew Lewis from uh, Capital Club and welcoming Mark Colburn today, who's joining us to talk about all things leadership. Thank you. Uh, so Mark, thanks for coming along, taking the time. I want to ask and probe into your background, and your experience, and start off with your upbringing. Tell us a little bit more about the values that your parents instilled in you in the early days. Yeah, very much so. I think, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for welcoming me into the Capital Club Dubai. It's a privilege to obviously, you know, attend this podcast. So, yeah, I suppose my, you know, my values growing up as a child in South Wales, working class family. You know, my dad was a crane driver. My mum was actually a school caretaker. So, you know, on, only child, no brothers or sisters. So I guess the values that were instilled into me were based on the true values of human, um, I suppose, just, just human behavior, you know, kindness, love, affection, honesty, integrity. And I guess even growing up as a child, those actions were just normal, you know, but I didn't realize the importance of them, certainly until later life, you know. So looking back to childhood, what, what did you learn? What did sport teach you or do you learn from sport as Ooh, a child, that's a, that's as a, a teenager? Question, isn't it? Mm. Um, I think I first fell in love with sport and more so movement, mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily sport to start with, but the, just the great feeling of movement and what movement gave me as a human being, you know, which I suppose is the, the first feeling of health, you know, of strength, clarity you know in yeah. in my mindset and and then certainly the appreciation of dopamine and what dopamine gives us you know the happy drug that you know we know through neuroscience now is is what helps to almost fuel the rest of our systems you know and and i think what it gave me was the feeling of not being afraid to to actually take action. And did you have sporting idols then or other idols in life? Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. I'd love to take the audience back, you know, to 1980 and 1984 when, you know, Daley Thompson, who was, you know, my sporting idol, um, even though my parents, you know, I loved them unconditionally. My dad was my hero, you know, my dad was known as Mr. Nice Guy because he was a true gentleman through and through. And I guess the sport inside of it, yeah, definitely, definitely Daley Thompson, because I remember, I think I may have been maybe about 10 or 11, and just thinking to myself, when I first started to understand, I suppose, the reality and the power of the Olympics, just how good this athlete was. He wasn't world-class at one event yeah. or two, three or four events. This incredible human being was world-class at 10 events, you know, in the decathlon. And I just kept saying to my dad, how? <laughs> how can this guy run, jump, throw, you know, leap, uh, just like, almost like a god, yeah. you know, almost like a god. So yeah, he was definitely, Definitely my sporting hero, um, you know, to see him win gold in 1980 and 1984 was just an incredible memory, you know, for me as a, as a human, you know, so, but yeah, what a legend, you know. Yeah. Any others? Oh, I think, I think in terms of individual sport, I think Ray Raiden, who was a very famous snooker player, who actually was from the town where I grew up, and, and the reason why I say that is because, you know, he was a character, yeah. you know, he was a real genuine gentleman, a, a, a real character, a funny guy, 
you know, but as soon as he had that snooker cue in his hand, you know, he was just like a wizard. You know, he really was. So yeah, good old Ray Rain. Okay. So what, what key messages did you learn in life that allowed you to think about winning or becoming a winner? I think it started with feelings, actually. You know, going through my teenage life and just having this natural ability to, to embrace skills in, in any sport, whether it was swimming, cycling, running, football, rugby, you know, I just enjoyed learning the skills because my late father always said that Mark didn't have a stop button. Okay, and that really helped me in a lot of the endurance events, you know, but I think what it taught me and to use a great quote, you know, by, by Mike Tyson, you know, Mike Tyson, in my opinion, probably one of the best heavyweight boxers ever. And he uses a great quote and the quote is, is, is meaningful for the word discipline. To do something you hate, but to do it like you love it. And for many people, you know, certainly in, in the ages of 14, 15, 16, you almost don't want to do those things because you know it's hard work, you get out of breath, it's uncomfortable. But the rewards of going through that pain, you know, can be enormous. You know, it can be enormous. So I think the skills that I learnt help me to embrace the values of, of determination, certainly resilience, you know, because certainly as a child, as a teenager, you know, there's lots of failures, you know, but in my opinion, that's probably the best way to learn, you know, because there's a great quote that I use now as a speaker, is that every master was once a disaster, including me. <laughs> And so what happened in May 2009 to change all that? Yes, well, I think the, you know, the run up to, you know, to 2009, you know, I got married in 1991. My ex-wife and I, we decided to part company in 2006, you know, and we had a wonderful daughter together, you know, and I love my daughter unconditionally. But then when I got divorced and I moved to the capital, you know, in Wales, which is Cardiff. It was a time in my life where I guess I had more opportunity and more time to participate in more sports. So I was a keen rock climber, I was racing triathlon, and one of the sports that really took my fancy, you know, which was paragliding. So qualified in 2008, and then in May 2009, which if you remember, was a bank holiday, you know, May Day bank holiday, in South Wales and flying over the Gower Peninsula above Swansea, you know, a very famous, you know, town in Wales. And maybe around 15 meters above the ground, you know, flying with the club that I was part of. And there was maybe, I think about 20 or 21 pilots flying that day. So, you know, I was in good company. We had a fantastic day, 20 degrees, perfect conditions. And then around 5.15 p.m., as I was flying across the top ridge, at, at probably around 40 feet or 15 meters, I flew into what they call a crosswind. And it basically blew the whole canopy, just a, a complete, you know, a complete blowout. So the canopy collapsed. I'm looking down at the grass thinking, oh dear, <laughs> because there's only one way I'm going, which was straight down onto the grass, you know. And it was just a, I suppose, a complete freak of nature. Maybe just in the wrong place at the wrong time, who knows. But as I'm falling and everything just, everything just goes into slow motion. And I remember actually looking down and seeing the grass coming up and seeing my flying boots actually hitting the grass with this almighty thud. And then I got dragged for maybe almost a hundred meters uncontrollably, fully conscious, and just thinking to myself as it stopped, as the whole tumbling experience stopped, just lying on the grass, just staring up at this beautiful, beautiful blue sky, and just thinking to myself, wow, that was close. <laughs> that, was, that was really close, because I'm in no pain. 
And then as I looked down my body, both my legs were almost just mangled and twisted, almost like pipe cleaners, you know. And then I thought to myself, why can't I feel my legs? Why is there no movement, no feeling? To then realize that, you know, I'm totally paralyzed from the waist down. And one of the paragliding pilots was a fully trained medic. You know, he came down, landed, he ran over, you know, as quick as he could. And I'm just totally paralyzed on the floor from my waist down. And this gentleman says to me, oh my gosh, are you still alive? I said, Dennis, I, I can't feel my legs. So immediately he goes into medic mode, he radios for the Wales Air Ambulance, who thankfully arrived within 10 or maybe 12 minutes, you know, and then they obviously went to work to stabilize me, you know, with morphine and a neck collar then and carefully, carefully lifted me and placed me onto the, the spinal board. And then he lifted me off, you know, to Swansea Hospital. And I suppose that was the end of one life and the beginning of a new life, you know. So from the horror of the collapse to the relief of being a, alive, it was then a long minimum six months recovery in hospital. What, what was that like mentally and physically? The very first night was scary. And the reason why it was scary, not, not only because I was totally paralyzed from the waist down, not knowing what I'd done at this point, you know, I didn't know what I'd done. And I'll never forget my parents turning up that night. And I'll never forget my mum walking down the corridor and saying to the nurse, where is he? I'll give him paragliding. Where is he? <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'm lying, I'm lying in this hospital bed thinking, oh my gosh, now I'm in trouble. And my mum walked in, she's in tears. She doesn't know what I've done, you know, and I'm crying, she's crying, I'm trying to console her. And my dad leaned over and he put his hand on my shoulder and he says to me, I told you, didn't I? I told you to be careful. And I said, Dad, now is not really the time, you know, to give me a row or a telling off, you know. But that evening, you know, I had my MRI and my X-ray and I was told that I'd broken my back. And I'll never forget speaking to the consultant and just saying, sorry? did you just say I broke my back? Because I didn't know what breaking your back was like. And I had a huge thoracic fracture at T12, which is around, around the belly button area, you know. And, uh, and then the, the doctor saying to me after maybe an hour or so of just, you know, just trying to let this terrible news, this horrendous news settle in, you know, that they didn't have a surgeon, you know, in the hospital because he was on holidays they called him and called him, but no answer. So then the next day they had to take me to Cardiff, to the capital, you know, to, uh, to the university hospital. And that's when more MRIs, more x-rays to be told that, you know, unfortunately my spinal cord was so swollen that they couldn't operate on me. So I had to wait a whole week, you know, just lying in this hospital bed, staring at the ceiling, just thinking, this is probably the end, you know, this is probably the end. So there was initially, you know, for people who understand the Kobler-Ross change curve, you know, you go through shock, denial, you know, anger. And I suppose internally there was lots of anger. However, there was probably a huge sense of relief that I was still alive. Certainly a huge sense of gratitude, you know, because it could have been much worse. Technically, I probably should have ended up in the local cemetery. I should never have survived, you know, that kind of crash. But, you know, thankfully I did. And, uh, and that 94 days in the hospital on my back after my spinal cord operation um, was just a very, very slow process. And, you know, there was times where, you know, I said to my parents, do you know what, just take me to Holland you know, let me go through the euthanasia injection and just, just get this process over and done with, you know. And my dad caught hold of me one night and he said, Mark, please just stop. Stop these thoughts because you're a winner. You're going to get through this. You're a winner. You've never given up on anything you've ever, 
you know, achieved and tried to do in your life, why would you give up now? And that was the, that was the pattern interrupt, that was the kick up the backside I really needed, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was so grateful for that harsh conversation, you know. So, so yeah, six months in, in hospital in total, and, uh, and then left hospital in the September 2009, mm -hmm. and, uh, and within four weeks I was back in the gym. <laughs> yeah, it was a choice, you know. Yeah, so you've talked, <clears throat> and, it, and for our listeners and viewers with the Capital Club, they may pick up that both uh, Mark and I are Welsh, no, no relation. But what does what does your home country, what does being Welsh, mean to you? Oof, that's a that's a great question, actually. Um, I think for the listeners and the audience who may not know the history of Wales, you know, Wales has been a country that had, I suppose, a, a, an incredible amount of generosity, um, a lot of coal you know, that, that we gave to the rest of the world. And certainly the Celtic history, you know, of, of being what I would regard as a very kind warrior. It's the only way I can explain when I meet people here in Dubai and I feel very privileged, you know, to live in this wonderful, wonderful part of the Middle East. You know, what, what, what does Welsh actually really mean? And what does it look like? And the only way I can explain it is a, is, is a very kind warrior. You know, and and for me, you know, being Welsh through and through, you know, is a is a very proud feeling indeed because it's true that we are generous people, we're kind people, we're honest people, we have integrity, and that goes back to my values that was instilled into me, you know, from when I was a child. Because I suppose every person around the world goes through their storms. You know, we all go through our storms, but the art of resilience is how you pick yourself up, how you keep moving forward, you know, thinking above the line, staying positive. And I think that's where, you know, learning the art of resilience has really helped me. And I honestly think being Welsh, definitely, it's definitely helped me to overcome, you know, the traumas that I've gone through, you know. But great question, I like that question. So if we fast forward, to the second life, if you like. You went through a process where you were experimenting with what to do and you get picked up by British Cycling. Um, describe your experiences there. How, that, how did that happen and then, and then what was that like to suddenly go from in a hospital bed to a year later thinking, you know, I'm working with some of the best of the best? Yeah, it, it was... Um it was almost like it was meant to be. And the reason why I say that is, one year after my accident, when I started cycling, you know, with a disability, you know, so I have, for the listeners, I have what they call lower leg paralysis, which basically means that I've got severe nerve damage in all of the muscles in my legs, except my quads, just the front part of my legs. So my feet don't work, so I've got no plantar flexion or dorsiflexion, my calf muscles don't fire, my hamstrings don't fire, and my glutes or my bum muscles don't fire. So the ability to walk, and I use Charlie Chaplin as a reference, for instance, for those of you that know Charlie Chaplin, as a reference of how I walk because I'm using my quads to, to function. However, when I step onto the bike and I clip in my cycling shoes, even though only half my legs work, I don't feel disabled because I can push and pull, you know? And I suppose having cycles since I was probably about eight, seven or eight, you know, like most people in the South Wales Valleys, it was easy. Yeah. It was just learning it with a disability, you know? So I think one year after my accident, when the paramedic who treated me called me, because he'd seen on Facebook that I'd started winning some cycling races. And he said to me, would you like to take part in a charity cycle ride around Wales to help raise money for the air ambulance who treated me on the day of my crash. Yeah. This guy saved my life. Mm -hmm. It took me half a second to say yes. Yeah. And then he dropped the bombshell. <laughs> and the bombshell was, it was, it was almost uh, 900 kilometers in a week. 
I said, sorry. <laughs> he said, look, we're, we're cycling around the periphery of Wales, around the circumference, and we'd love for you to join us. I said, Ross, I'm in. Because I knew that it was okay to fail if I, if I was going to fail because everybody fails at something. But what I could not stomach and think about was not trying, you know? So that's when the very first day of this charity cycle ride, which was June 2010, and it was uh, 140 kilometers from Cardiff to the first stop on the first day, over the Brecon Beacons, the National Park in Wales. And if anybody's ever been to Wales, you'll know Wales is not flat. It's certainly not Al Kudra, you know? And I met this gentleman who I'd never met before. And he asked me, you know, what was wrong with my legs? Why am I on crutches? I explained I broke on my back, you know, a year earlier. And after a 20 minute conversation, this gentleman said these words to me that changed the course of my life forever. He said, are you, um, are you training for the London 2012 Paralympic, uh, Paralympic Games in two years time? I said, no, why, why would I do that? He said, I think you should. I was like, oh my gosh, I'd never even thought of the Paralympics. So I said to this gentleman, can I ask who you are? And he explained he was a chiropractor, Dr. Matthews. He understood about my, you know, my accident and my injury and my disability. And it was that moment that almost sparked the idea. And it was just an idea. Just to maybe, just maybe, get to the London 2012 Paralympic Games. It's a home games. Who doesn't want to be at the home Paralympics or a home Olympics? So it was that moment that really set the fire alight. And I said to my cycling coach at the time, Neil Smith, what do you think? Do you think I could get there? He said, well, we can only try. He said, but I need two things from you. I need commitment and I need honesty. That's it. I said, what? That's, that's it? And he said, yeah, let's see if British Cycling will take you on. And that's when the conversation started. And then obviously the door opened, you know, with British Cycling. And, uh, and I was 40, 40, uh, 40, 41 at the time. So I was no spring chicken, but, you know, I was delivering the power. And I guess British Cycling saw potential in me, you know. So that... Um, that moment, that experience of being selected by British Cycling, you know, just to become a guest rider to start with, was just, yeah, just almost the start of a dream coming true. Very good. So fast forward a year, you end up competing in the UCI World Championships in Los Angeles. And on your journey, and at the peak of that sport, <coughs> And then you have another awful bit of news. And you mentioned earlier about Mr. Nice Guy, about your father. Tell us what happened. All through 2011, I was a guest rider for British Cycling. And I was taken to five races all over Europe, and I came back with five medals. So British Cycling knew that I had the potential to go on and, and do something. Because you never know if you're going to win. You just have to focus on the process, not the outcome. And I'd gone to the World Road Championships. I came back with a silver medal in the time trial. And that's when British Cycling said, OK, we need you in Manchester. We need you to be part of the world class program, to be training every day, six days a week. And we'll take you to Los Angeles on the track just to see if you have the potential to maybe, just maybe become a world champion. And if you then become a world champion or, or you're on the radar, that's when you start focusing on the correct discipline for London 2012. So this is almost 12 months in the planning, you know. So I'll never forget moving to Manchester, which was September 2011, and my mum ringing me, you know, to say, oh, you know, hope you're okay, and general parent conversation. And she said, unfortunately, my dad had been taken into hospital. And I said, why, what's wrong? You know, my dad was fit and he was healthy and, you know, he wasn't overweight. And she said, well, he's been having terrible chest pains and they've taken him in, they've put the camera down and they've identified that he's got a tumour. 
it's an inoperable tumour and it's an aggressive tumour. I said, okay, well, what does that really mean? Well, it means that he's probably got about six months. And my dad was 74. And I kept thinking, well, the message he gave me when I was a kid that one day in the future, tomorrow will be our last day. You know, we're all, we're all living on this incredible journey of life that is literally a ticking clock, you know. So you can imagine, you know, I was heartbroken. I was just distraught. But like when I spoke to my dad then when he came out of the hospital to start with, I said, well, do you want me to come home and look after you, take care of you with my mum? And he said, no, 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 it's fine. You know, it's fine. You just focus on your training. So literally six months, you know, five and a half, six months later, I went to Los Angeles for the World Track Championships. And I'll never forget on the Thursday morning, the 9th of February, waking up, I think I had like 20 missed calls on my mobile. And knowing you just know, you just know there's something not right, you know. And I rang my mum and she said, look, I'm really sorry, but you know, your, your dad's passed away. He passed away in his sleep, you know, which was, I suppose, a blessing, no pain. And I'm just thinking to myself, I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. But a day before the world finals, what do I do? You know, and I'll never forget my coach ringing, you know, Professor Steve Peters, who's an incredible, you know, sports psychiatrist and psychologist and speaking to Professor Peters on the phone and him asking me, do you want to come home? You can fly home today. Nobody will judge you. Do you stay and not race? Or do you stay and race? But whatever you choose, your dad's not coming back. And I'll, I'll never forget these harsh words. I'm just thinking, I can't believe this gentleman is saying these words to me. But it's reality, isn't it? Yeah. And he said, look, I need to know what you want to do. And I said, look, I'm going to stay. You know, I'm going to race for my country. But more importantly, I'm going to race for my dad. And he said, OK, good luck. And he put the phone down. I was like, hello, <laughs> hello. But it's, it's reality, you know. And then the next day, you know, racing in the world finals. And even to this day, Matt, you know, I, I can't remember the race. I can remember going into the velodrome. I can't even remember actually being placed onto the bike. And I'll never forget then finishing the race and winning. And then obviously standing on the podium, you know, being awarded the rainbow jersey, you know, the jersey mm -hmm. of a world yeah. champion. And just thinking to myself, I just wish my dad was here, you know. So sad time, mm. really sad time, you know. Especially, I suppose, going home then, attend, you know, attending yeah. my dad's funeral. That was, um, that was heartbreaking, you know. But... Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's life, you know. So against that backdrop and becoming a world champion, once you had time to reflect and get over that, not that you ever get over that loss, what did that then mean to you, given where you'd come from? I think what it meant to me was how short life actually really is and how unprecedented change can almost happen when you least expect it. You know, and there's a great quote, another great quote, you know, by, by Mike Tyson, that we have to live life on life's terms. You know, why isn't life pleasant and happy and cheerful, you know, every day? Well, if it was, it wouldn't be life. Yeah. I thought you were going to quote his other one about uh, everyone has a plan until you get smacked in the mouth, <laughs> which has happened a couple of times. It, it, it is yeah. just a case of where life does yeah. go on, you know, yeah. and it, it was it was a tough time to make decisions because, you know, I suppose my mindset was a little clouded, mm. but I knew when I kept asking myself these questions, what would my dad want me to do, you know, and every single time it was keep going, yeah. keep going, keep going. When you think there's not one more step left there's always one more step you know and a big thanks to my late mum you know she was just like yeah she was just like granite you know hard as nails and encouraging and always kept me on the on the right path you know okay so coming back 
from championships, then you, you're dealing with another loss. And then how far out was London? Seven months. Yeah, seven yeah. months. And that's obviously another level. So how did you, how did you prepare given that, you know, that, again, that loss and you were seven months now to the Olympics, how do you pick yourself up? And I, I think, um, I think everything that I've been successful in when I joined British Cycling is a big thanks to all the coaches. Because remember, you know, I joined British Cycling at the age of 41. I'd never been to a Paralympics. I'd never been to a World Track Championships or a World Road Championships. I had to become coachable. Okay, so you become that, almost that cycling sponge where you start absorbing information and putting a lot of trust you know, a lot of trust in people who I'd only known for maybe six or eight months, you know. And, and when you start believing in the process, you start believing in the organization because British Cycling didn't have 110 gold medals for nothing, you know. So you start having belief, okay. You start then appreciating the process. Yes, it's important to have belief in you as a human, but the most important pillar of all is you having belief in yourself doing the process. So you learn all these skills and then you become that master, okay? And it's okay to question, you know, advice from the coaches, whether it's the physiologist, the biomechanic, even the strength coach, my endurance coach, the nutritionist, when somebody says to you, okay, I need you to eat this food at this time of day and you only need to eat this amount. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know? But you know it works. Okay, you drink this amount of fluid at this time, you go to bed at this time, you do all of this process because it's a very controlled environment which helps you to achieve peak performance. Yeah but not only peak performance, but peak performance at the right time, yeah. you know? So that seven month journey to London 2012, when I guess, you know, the whole world got behind us. You know, it was a home, a home Olympics, yeah. which was a great warm up, a great warm up for the Paralympics, mm. you know? And the whole country got behind us, but remember the whole world was watching, mm. you know? So there was a lot of pressure Stress is only what you make it, of course. And I guess I went into London when I got the selection, you know, literally two months out. I had a skip in my step. I was excited because I'd literally wished and wanted and craved for this moment ever since I was a kid, ever since I was a child. You know, it's the Daily Thompson moment. Yeah. You know, you've done the hard work. Now it's time to perform. Which is full circle. So, when, when you look at Olympic performance and the training that goes into that, how do you draw parallels between that and business? So business now is where you play um, and where you operate. How do you draw the parallels between that and elite sports? Another great question. You know, what can we learn from the world of elite sport? I think I think in business, if you think of all different um, areas of business, but you don't need to teach determination or discipline because people turn up. Yeah. That, that's half of the process, turning up. Some of them do. Some <laughs> or maybe most, yes. But I think for me, it's, it's what I learned from, you know, the, the aggregation of marginal gains where are the small differences in what you do as a business leader to make all of the small differences make all the difference? You know, when you add up the one percents, you know, the early nights, the eating healthily, the hydration, the exercise, the stretching, the yoga, the breathing, how can you be better tomorrow than what you were yesterday? Okay, and that for me, you look at people like Michael Phelps, you know, 23 gold medals, you know, Daley Thompson, two gold medals. And I'll use myself as an example because I, I wasn't born a world or Paralympic champion. I wasn't. 
I was born Margaret's boy. I had to become that person. I had to have that mindset. Yeah. You know, I had to deliver those skills. And I had to go through, I suppose, the trauma, you know, of learning all those skills. There was nobody that asked more questions in my coach than me. Because I just wanted to know, yeah. you know. Um, so I think the lessons can definitely be learnt through health and well-being. Definitely through wellness, looking after yourself. And maybe, just to finish, I think maybe just being kind to yourself. Because of this reason, okay? You can turn the, you can turn the body off, as in physically. Okay, you rest, you breathe, you do yoga, whatever. The hardest thing is switching the brain off. Yeah. Which Professor Steve Peters, you know, through his research has identified that we all have that inner voice. We all have in our heads two voices, the logical and the, and the emotional. And that, that for me has been a game changer. Coaching and teaching, you know, incredible companies how to manage that inner voice. So you can switch off and you can relax, you know. So that led, well, London obviously led to Olympic gold. And then, and then eventually your MBE. Tell us about that and the link to your, your late mum. <laughs> I, I've always said that my life has almost been, almost mapped out for me. And I think after breaking two world records in one day in London 2012 on the track, which was almost just like a childhood dream. You know, if you're going to win a gold medal at the home games in the Paralympics, for Paralympics GB, go and break your own world record, okay? It was just like a fairy tale, and I'll never forget coming off the track and, you know, speaking to my late mum and my daughter was there, and my mum saying, you know, my dad would have been really, really proud of me and, you know, made my country proud. And then actually then going home after the Paralympics and speaking to my mum. Now, my mum's birthday is the 14th of November. So this is about a month and a half after the Paralympics. So I went home, celebrated my mum's birthday, you know, with her and my daughter, and it was a great time. So picture the scene. I went to rent a house then in Cardiff because I was training back home in Wales. And I'll never forget being at my mum's house about a week before Christmas, okay? It's maybe the second week of December. And I'm staying with my mum before I moved into this rental accommodation. So I'm just having my breakfast, my mum's in the shower, and there's a knock at the door. So I opens the door and it's the postman, who I know personally. You know, I've known this gentleman for like 20 years. Yeah. Morning, John. Morning, Mark. He said, um, congratulations on winning your gold medal. I have a letter for you. Now, it's, it's Wales. Yeah. It's December. It's raining. Okay, standard. I said, John, do you, do you want to come on in? Because he's like literally holding this, this envelope. And he said, do you mind if I just wait while you open it? So as I looked down on the back was a stamp and it said Buckingham Palace. I'm like, John, I, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to do with this letter. So he said, oh, good luck. And off he went. So I opened the letter. I read down the letter and it basically said at the bottom in big black bold font, do not disclose this letter to anyone as part of the embargo from the news for the New Year's Honours list, you know. So as I'm reading this letter, who's walking down the stairs? My mum. So, so I closed the letter up pretty quick, slid it into my, into my rucksack, and my mum said, um, who's, who's that at the door? I saw it's just the postman dropping off some mail. Thinking, I've got away with it, you know. So anyway, I moved to Cardiff. Literally a week after Christmas, 1st of January, I'm in this house where I'm renting. My phone goes, it's maybe 8 a.m. in the morning. So it picks up the phone, expecting now my mum to say, Happy New Year. Good morning, how are you feeling? So I picks up the phone, Morning, ma'am. I said, Happy New Year to you, how are you feeling? I've just been told <laughs> by, by John Simmons, who's her neighbour, that you've just been awarded the MBE. Is that right? I said, yeah, it's pretty cool, ma'am, isn't it? What, what do you think of that? 
And why didn't you tell me? I said, well, the funny thing is, ma'am, the letter that I had of the Queen said on the letter, do not disclose this letter to anyone. Mark, I'm your mother. I'm not anyone. So, so that moment really yeah. set up uh, the 17th of May, 2013, mm -hmm. when you know, I took my mum and my daughter to Buckingham Palace to be awarded, you know, the member of the British Empire, you know, from Prince Charles, now King Charles. Mm -hmm. And it was an incredible day because it truly was a day for my mum, you know, to take my mum to Buckingham Palace, having seen her only child go through hell and back to live out the childhood dream. So we're walking out from Buckingham Palace to the car. I've got my daughter on my one arm, my mum on the other arm. And as we're walking through the courtyard, I'll never forget this moment, Matt, as long as I live. My mother just stopped in her tracks and she stared at me and she said, did you tell him? Now this was in the middle of no conversation. I said, tell who? Well, Prince Charles. I said, tell him what, mum? Well, his birthday. It's the same as mine, the 14th of November. And my daughter, you can imagine, she's just crying in laughter, you know. And I said, mum, I was busy, yeah. you know, I'm really sorry, but I, I honestly, honestly, Matt, I really wish, I really wish that I'd said to Prince Charles, excuse me, sir, I just want to tell you, your birthday is the same as my mum, you know, I, that would have just made yeah. my mum's day, you know, but, um, so yeah, great moment in time, you know, very grateful. So from Daily, so from the Daily Thompson image to fast forward to you then winning gold, getting an MBE. And you, you said yourself, it was almost, you know, it was a dream, childhood dream, it was almost meant to be, even though it was a roundabout way of getting there. So if it was all sort of predetermined, what was life like then after ticking all the boxes, right? Winning gold, MBE, there's nothing left to do. The strange thing is, Matt, I remember when I joined British Cycling and we set out, you know, with a vision board, you know, world championships. So if you become a podium athlete, yeah. you know, bronze, silver, gold. There's the potential to go on to London. World champion, tick. Trauma of losing my dad, you know, heartbreaking. Even now, you know, 11 years on, I still have that feeling of loss, you know, yeah. that, that probably will never leave me, you know. London 2012 selection, that was one of the vision board, yeah. you know, Criterias, tick. Going into London 2012, still improving, still getting stronger, still getting lighter. And then I suppose to go into London and almost break, you know, break the history books, to break two world records in one day, that, that wasn't on my vision board, yeah. okay? Qualification was, and then the final, okay? So to break two world records, to win a gold, was just the stuff of dreams, you know? And then obviously to be awarded the MBE, that certainly wasn't on the vision board. You can't train for that, but yeah. you know, a win's a win. And I guess then in 2013, I continued on the world class cycling program for a year. And then I had to make a decision. Do I stay? Do I focus on Rio, you know, 2016? Or do I just say, thanks, I'm done. And it took me probably three months really, you know, to think about the decision. And I thought, well, Everything that was on my vision board, I've achieved. World champion, world record holder, gold in the games, MBE. It was now time to hand the baton over to somebody else, you know. And that's when the conversation, you know, that I had with British Cycling was thanks, you know, for everything. It's been an incredible, incredible journey. It's been a blast, but it's now time to move on, you know. So we shook hands and parted company. And the wonderful thing with British Cycling, you know, with Sir Dave Brailsford and Andy Harrison was, you know, that the door is always open. If you change your mind, pick the phone up. The phone call never happened, yeah. you know. They know when you're done. So you've spent the last decade um, in your next career, right? Public speaking, leadership coaching, working with individuals and organizations. And, um, putting back, if you like, the last, the last 10 years. Um, when you present, when you sit with companies, 
what do you talk about? What do you, what do you, um, what key messages do you try and get across? I think, I think the important thing, you know, when I made the decision to step into the world of speaking, and I'm same again, I'm so grateful for the people that have trained me, coached me, helped me, facilitated me through my journey, you know, because if you think to 2014, you know, I was just a storyteller, just having this incredible ability and a great memory to recite information in a way that people would understand, you know, and that's why I guess the, the journey that I've been through can help other people because they can learn from the lessons that, that, that I had gone through, you know, uh, along the way. So, you know, we're a decade on now, almost, um, 231 events. And I think what I ask and what I discuss with, you know, certainly the FTSE 250 companies, the large companies, is, you know, what do you want to achieve and, and what are your pain points right now, okay? And a lot of it is cultural change, you know, with many companies certainly digital change, digital transformation, where you now have machines, you know, we've now got ChatGPT, yes. you know, um, where we, we've had machines and technology do a lot of the work for us for a long time, mm. but now it's on that, you know, exponential acceleration, faster than ever, you know, faster than ever. And, and as human beings, how do we continue to keep up with the speed of change, okay? You, you go back 10 years ago, okay? When you were maybe receiving X amount of emails every day from eight till six, okay? All of a sudden now, 10 years on, you've got email, WhatsApp, text messages, Teams call. It's almost like you've just got this barrage, you know, this barrage of information. So it's how do we deal with that as human beings because we can only deal with change so fast. Yeah. And we're not very good. We're not very good at adapting to change as human beings. We're quite slow. We, we don't like Evolve. change. We don't like change. We don't like change. You know, we don't like change. We love certainty, security. We don't like going through the pillars of change, apprehension, fear, doubt, uncertainty. All of these feelings at a cellular level, yeah. you know. As primates, we love to be calm. Yeah. Well, as an Olympic athlete, when you're dealing with change, how do you stay calm? How do you prepare, you know, for battle, you know? Yeah. So, and that's where logical thinking, you know, wins hands down. And that's the difference between winning and losing life and death. In some cases, yeah, yeah, very much so, you know. So Dubai is now home? Yes. The last Eight, 18 months, yes, 18 months. Yes, been through two summers. I've survived. <laughs> it's almost as, almost like a near-death experience cycling in the summer. I don't know why you do it. Yes, it can be. So in summary, um, if you could go back and thank those dead or alive for your success, who would you, who would you like to thank? Oh, great question. I think definitely my parents, you know, because I guess they didn't realize or they didn't know what they were molding me into from, from a child, you know, from a child. And I guess both my parents kept me in my lane in different ways, okay? So my dad was very quiet, very unassuming. My dad never swore at me. He never raised his voice at me because the stare was enough. <laughs> because yeah. I didn't want to know what yeah, was beyond the silence. the silence, you know. Whereas my mum, I suppose, half Irish, you know, hard as nails like granite, hard working, but, you know, with a big heart. So I'm, I'm so grateful, you know, to both my parents for moulding me. Certainly, I had a, an, an incredible lecturer in college when I studied sports science. There was a wonderful gentleman called Gary Bufton. And Gary Bufton... Uh, even though he was our PE teacher, he was actually a fifth dan in Kyoko Shinkai full contact karate. And Gary had that incredible way to coach, you know, young adults in the right way. So a big thanks to Gary and certainly Neil Smith, who was my first cycling coach, 
you know, with Disability Sport Wales, and we're still best friends now, 13 years on, you know. And obviously British Cycling, yeah. that the list is endless. Tom Stanton, who was my coach, you know, Tom almost became like a brother, you know. Um, Chris Ferber, Gareth Shepherd, you know, all these incredible individuals. Um, Professor Steve Peters, just an incredible mind. And, uh, and then all of the other coaches, the, you know, the biomechanics, the nutritionists, you know, all of those incredible um, leaders in, the, in their own field, you know. Big, big thanks to, to them all, really, for helping me to, to yeah. literally to live out, you know, this, this incredible childhood dream, you know. And it's, it is a, a childhood dream in a box, you know, it really is. So a big thanks, you know, to everybody. And, um, yeah, just so grateful, you know, so grateful. Very good. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. With uh, whatever you do next. Yeah, I think, you know, for me now living in Dubai as a leadership coach, you know, as a conference speaker, um, you know, as a broadcaster, it's, it's helping other people on their journey to achieve their dreams. Yeah. You know. Which and, is a good. Um, and I think that's what's, um, that's what's really important for me because, you know, I've lived my childhood dream, my childhood dream's in the box. You know, it, it, uh, it really is. And I think it all comes back to a poem that I read a long time ago about being honest with yourself and trying because, you know, it, it, it's okay to fail because we all fail at something. But what I cannot stomach is not trying, you know. And um, that's all you can ask. That's all you can ask, yeah. You know, and the poem, The Man in the Glass, is something that really changed my life you know, for uh, forever. So, you know, with your, your listeners and the audience, check out The Man in the Glass. It's a wonderful four passage poem that, uh, that helped to change my life for good. But thank you ever so much. Thank, thank you. you to the Capital Club Dubai for the invite. And it's been an absolute pleasure. So well, my pleasure. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.